uh, Gandhi and Nehru, they're, they, they, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're living still and they, they belong to all Indians. Then, well, they're uh, still running for office. Absolutely. So. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> and maybe not in the, in the best way sometimes, but anyhow, that's another problem. But, um, but particularly, I, sh I should compare maybe my father to, to um, Tagore. My, my the, the, you know, that I'm running also a um, um, literary prize in, in Pondicherry mm. for the Francophonie. Uh, I, I put it under the name of Tagore, that my, my father met Tagore. He was very young when Tagore went in Iran. No, I think these kind of personality, whether we're there or not, whether the, the family is there or not, uh, the, the people, yeah. they, right. he used to say, I belong to the, you know, to these people. Mm -hmm. he, he has spent all his life there. Then I think they're much more even sometimes more faithful to him than I, I could be. Right, right. Um, well, let me just briefly share my experience, which mm -hmm. uh, I was much younger when the revolution happened. I was seven years old. Um, and I came from uh, also a fairly prosperous family. Um, my father uh, was one of nine or 10 children and he was uh, kind of a, a, quite a, a noted and, and uh, loud atheist in Iran. Uh, the, you know, the kind of atheist who always had a pocket full of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would pull out at inappropriate <laughs> times. That kind of atheist. Um, we, we, after we were in Iran during the revolution, and I think what, what you may not remember about what happened in the revolution uh, is that when Khomeini returned, he You're said, lucky, by the way. Yeah. Don't, re don't remember. <laughs> he, uh, when Khomeini returned, he said that he had no interest in, mm. in politics, that he just wanted to go back uh, to, his, to his studies and, and be left alone. And my dad, who never trusted the mullahs, mm. uh, basically heard that and said, bullshit. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and thought it might be a good idea for, for the family to just leave for a very brief while. So we left with very little um, until things settled down. And obviously, things never <coughs> settled down. And we went to the United States. Uh, again, I'm not sure if you remember the early 80s. It wasn't the best time in the world to be Iranian in America. This was at the heart of the Iran yeah. hostage crisis, uh, 444 days in which Americans were being held hostage in, in the uh, we were uh, American actually. embassy. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, for a, a seven-year-old kid trying his hardest to fit in. Uh, in the United States. I mean, I did everything that I possibly could to distance mm. myself from, mm. from my culture. I actually spent a good part of the 1980s pretending to be Mexican. <laughs> you, know, you could be, you could yeah, be. It yes, works, no problem, it sort yeah. of works. I learned how to break dance. That, you know, they, it just, uh, <laughs> and um, because, you know, the anti-Iranian sentiment at that time was, was quite uh, high. Um, you know, and, and it was not easy to be Iranian a, in America, mm. as opposed to now when it's fantastic. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, so much has changed. Yes, in, in that's years. what I wanted to say. Completely different world. Um, yeah. And uh, and so for me, you know, I, I had to uh, much much later in life reconnect mm. with my culture and with my mm. identity. I mean, I remember being at university and having to take Persian classes mm -hmm. to learn how mm. to read and write. Yeah. Uh, with all these, you know, white people around yeah. me, and, and everyone's wondering why I'm in this beginning Persian class, yes. and, yeah. and had to read about uh, Iranian history and Iranian culture, um, mainly from Americans, from mm. non-Iranian mm. yeah, um, yeah, sure. writers, and mm. and that that was a very you want to say we, we can't me. get rid of this country. It's yeah, exactly, exactly that. Yeah, that's, 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 right, that's exactly right. And so for me, yeah. that sense. Uh, of that dual identity has mm. always been there. I had there. that also, yeah. sure. I, I've been back to sure. Iran not, not since 2009. I've, I'm, I've been told by uh, uh, cousins, mm -hmm. all mm. my cousins there, uh, that you know, I, I shouldn't come back for a little while until things settle down. But it is, it is a, a unique experience, mm. I think, mm. this that, that, idea that, that, our, yeah. that our identity Absolutely. is shaped by Absolutely. a country that we, we are at distance that, from. That is, that is fascinating for me. I can, I can just give an example. But by the way, myself, you know, I, uh, when people, they say to me uh, sometimes, uh, oh, you're a good writer in Fran French. I said, that's normal. You know, I, I've been brought mm. up in France, even in Iran. I was in a 
But when people, they tell me, <laughs> uh, you speak very well Farsi, I'm quite proud of it, in fact. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's normal as well, but it's not so normal, you know, being from age of 12 and doing, having, and I write Persian, and uh, as you say, I used to copy the writing of my father to have a nice writing mm -hmm. way of writing. Mm -hmm. And my brother, uh, my nephew, and, and they don't speak a word mm -hmm. because the mother is French, and my, and now they have 32, 18, or I don't know, a little bit. All of them, they say to, your fa the, to my brother, why you didn't taught yeah. me Persian, yeah. taught us Persian. They want to go to Iran. There is really something about this country. But by the way, you do understand Indians very well that you have, I, I, they have the same thing. I think the, these very deep, I mean, country that they have deep culture, mm -hmm. um, and um, how can I say, the, um, uh, the, the sensitiveness, the sensi the, there is something about uh, old culture yeah. which you cannot uh, forget about it. And also about Orient that, uh, in, in my opinion, the, the, um, uh, the soul is, 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 is very uh, strong. Yeah. Um, then that is a fact. All my cousins, uh, all over the, they, they, they are, whether they are uh, married to Iranian or to foreigners, the kids are brought up in a, in a Persian, uh, as you say. Uh, yes. and, and even if the parents they don't want, all of a sudden, as you, as a, as a young, they, they are attracted again and they go back to their past and... Uh, yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think my, my parents thought that life would be easier for me if I exactly. integrated fully exactly. into America, yeah. and I'm raising my children mm. to learn how to speak Farsi yeah, and, sure. and you know, sure. to be very cognizant sure. of, of their mm. culture. And it, it is interesting, that generation gap. I have a very, I don't even know if this is a, an answerable question before we get to the audience, mm. but do you think it's easier to be Iranian in France, or do you think it's easier to be Iranian in America? It's, it's difficult being Iranian anywhere. Yeah, especially Iran. <laughs> Believe me, especially yeah. Iran. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Let's say, because in, 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 um, in uh, France, uh, particularly, or in Europe in general, uh, being a foreigner, and uh, it's not easy um, to get through, uh, to, to, to do your, uh, you know, to, to, to make it. Yeah. It's much more easy in the United States. I, I can see that really uh, through. It's so funny. I, I used to say to yesterday, two days ago, I was telling to my new publisher, Alba Michel, that uh, my first publisher for a novel, Le Seuil, which is a very good publisher in France, between the three best publishers in France, they wrote on the cover of the book, the quatrième de couverture, under, how do you say the quatrième? The jacket. The jacket, exactly. They wrote a, an Iranian who writes directly in French. Mm -hmm. It was so ridiculous. Ooh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, tell the, I told them that it is ridiculous because you publish me in a red collection. It's for French writers. Either I am a French writer, either I'm not. It doesn't come to a mind of Anglo-Saxon to, to write an Indian who writes in English because <laughs> yeah. a lot of Indians I know, they speak much better English than British and then, I mean, American. Definitely of course, than I'm Americans, sorry. Yeah. I mean, American, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> but even That's even better true. English to, to, and in Bengal, I was, I mean, puzzled by the high level of, of English, even though that I, I, I don't consider myself being, uh, to being, to be an um, expert in English, you know. I, I can say, okay, in, in French I can say. But it, it won't come in there to say, Reza Aslan, write directly in American, you know. Those kind of things, you really feel it in France all the time. My, my, yeah. my niece, Hashtrudi, is not very difficult to pronounce, but you know, all the time, I, I've been presented at Hashragui, Bigudi, uh, <laughs> so many names, and my niece, that she has a, really, a lot of sense of humor, all the time they used to say, and, and she was brought up in, I mean, she's totally French, and uh, pardon, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, I said, okay, just hatch. Do that. <laughs> if you, can, you can't write, if you can't read, just, you're just throwing. <laughs> yeah. You see? No, no. Um, um, I think it's quite... I think uh, it's a very good point. I mean, I, I think that there are challenges in both ways. Mm. And you're right. You bring up a very good challenge about France, which is the very 
nature of laïcité and the conception of uh, assimilation is much more focused on assimilating to what France says is the mm. identity of the mm. country, right? Mm. I always jokingly say that when, when the French say assimilate, what they mean is stop being you and start being us. That's what they mean. <laughs> yeah. uh, Right. In the U.S., certainly that's not the case. I mean, of course, we're you know a nation of immigrants, mm, a very young nation, uh, um, and it's a it's a nation that that I, you know uh, it very easily absorbs multiple cultures. But at the same time, that that becomes a liability sometimes mm. because when you have to define your national identity not mm. based on a shared ethnicity or a shared. Uh, religion or a shared mm. culture or a shared race when everybody is different um, and what you have to define yourself by is a sense of uh, a, a, a collective acceptance to a set of you know shared values and this is something that I think Indians can really understand uh, then in times of stress in times of societal stress that notion of you know who we are as Americans starts to fracture and it becomes very easy to just simply find someone, some internal person to define yourself against. Um, and that's certainly what's happening mm. right now in, in the United States. So I think there's, there's certainly, there's, you're right, there's pros and cons. No, certainly. Both, and, and, and also there is another problem, you see, because they are not aware, American, or, you know, I'm, I'm, when Bush mixed up all the time Iraq and Iran, then, then you see, I mean, <laughs> But, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not, no, there's no war in Iran. It was in Iraq. I mean, or, and or he, sent, he sent the soldiers. He doesn't know where he had sent it, yeah. even that. You know, no, no, no. Okay, well, to, to, be, to be more exact, he didn't know the difference between Iraq and Iran. Yeah, that's it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, we had also our Sarkozy, who was also, <laughs> yeah. you know, he said, the Iranians are Shiite or Sunni. Iranians are Sunni or Shiite. And, but yeah. th that's one problem. And in the beginning, you, you said, uh, in, in fact, Iran, it's very complex, and I am also puzzled. Being brought up in, in, in France, when I was a kid, till my uh, age of university, we, our identity was Shahbanu Farah, you know, and she used to come, and I am totally Republican. I like this lady as a, as a, as a person, but, um, you know, as a queen, in my opinion, um, anyhow, parenthesis fermée, but, our identity was the beautiful Farah with her the cat queen, the, and the, yeah. the queen, Farah Shabanu, and she used to have, uh, you know, she used to have the Chanel when she, she came, she used to have picture with Chanel. And all of a sudden, being of the Shabanu Farah, we became of the Chador, and uh, our identity became that. And I tried to make understand to even my fellow journalists that we are neither this, neither that. If you want to caricaturize all the time a uh, country like, especially country which is so difficult to understand. I have the same problem with India. I'm coming to India since my, ch my, my really young age and I love this country. I think I know India better than some Indians. You know, I know it from the north to the south. And I am puzzled to see the uh, légèreté, the, the lightness, you don't say lightness, the, 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 the unconsciousness of some of our uh, journalists, they say, Indian woman, I said, my God, what Indian's woman, I mean, how you can generalize, or Indian, les uh, femmes uh, Iranian, Indian, uh, Iranian women, they all the time like to do that, either they're lazy, either they, they don't know, either, uh, Either the, the, mm -hmm. the head of the redaction told them to write like this, and that's it, you know. Then it's, uh, that's also another problem mm -hmm. about our country, which uh, since uh, now AT, they had forgotten the past now. We yeah. are just now the Islamic Republic, the, the, the evil, and that is worse, of course, in the United States. That is something that is not just about Iranian. Uh, unfortunately, society in the United States, they are not very well educated. You come out from New York and some state. I mean, uh, still some part in the United States, they're asking me, there is camels in the street of Tehran? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, donkeys, camels, yeah. and mullahs. <laughs> we actually, and by the way, they are quite the same sometimes. We actually ride carpets to work. That's it, you see, absolutely. 
then you see that is a problem that in, in Europe they're much more aware. And, uh, well, because uh, they're neighbors. Yeah, and, 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 and Britain, the United yeah, sure, States is very sure, much an isolated sure. country. No, you bring up a very good point, and, and I want to open it up to questions in a moment here, but uh, Iran, I've always seen it as very much a schizophrenic country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it has dual and we natures. are also, huh? Yeah, as, yeah. as, as yeah, Iranian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and throughout, certainly the, the recent past, whenever, it, you know, it has this sort of ancient Persian tradition and a, and a more, more contemporary Islamic tradition, and these two identities have, have you know, often clash with each other, uh, you know, sometimes been, you know, uh, combined. And whenever one of these mo two identities is suppressed, the other one rises to mm -hmm. the surface mm -hmm. with vengeance. Mm -hmm. you yes. know, people want to know how, how did we get from, uh, you know, the, the 60s to 1979? Well, we did so because the Shah brutally suppressed mm -hmm. uh, the, the Islamic character of the country, and so that aspect rose up in, in sort of vengeance. And now, the exact, the opposite, exact the opposite is happening. Yeah. The, the, the Persian heritage of Iran is being brutally suppressed. And when you talk to young Iranians, mm -hmm. all they care about is ancient Iran. I'll give you one very, very brief story. When, uh, and, and just sort of, not, not even ancient Iran, but frankly, even the days of the Shah, um, the palace of the Shah, immediately after the, the Iranian revolution uh, was preserved, exactly as it was when the Shah mm -hmm. left. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's now a, a museum, museum. Mm -hmm. but it's a museum to the horrific Western excesses of the Shah. And so you, you go through these rooms and you see these, you know, 14 karat gold chandeliers and this gaudy Louis the 14th furniture. Turns out that no dictator has any taste at all. Like, it doesn't matter where, it's just all dictators just don't have any taste. Also, but, a little bit better than Arab's one. <laughs> yes, maybe, anyway, yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit better than Saddam Hussein. A little, but, yeah, it's exactly uh, what I wanted to mean. But this is the, the problem with Iranians, is that we're always better than Iraqis. Yes. At least. <laughs> Never. It's just, at Arabs, least we're not Iraq. In general, yeah. yes. Or Arabs. Um, but, but it, at, in every one of these, by the way, uh, there's always sort of a little plaque explaining s a certain things. So, for instance, um, you know, uh, in the in the sitting room, the plaque yeah. will say, "In this room, uh, the Shah drank whiskey with Charles de Gaulle while Iranians were starving." And then in this room is the billiard room. In this room, uh, you know, the Shah played billiards with uh, President Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, while Iranians, uh, you know, could barely feed themselves. And it's obviously meant to be a, an expression of the horrific excess of the Shah. When you watch Iranians in this museum, yeah, particularly exactly. anyone under 30, I've been, yes. all they do is like, ooh, Charles de Gaulle was here? Oh my gosh. That's a, whoa, Jimmy Carter played with this? This is great. Yeah. Uh, even, even work, I mean, yeah, they I, love I, it. I've been with, with kids in 1985 uh, when I've been to border illegally. It's why I'm leaving yeah, Iran, yeah. you know, at that time. I, I went to Iran in uh, 95, uh, 85, 86 illegally because I thought as a journalist I can't write about a country that I haven't seen. And I remember when the, sl the, the smuggler told my smuggler, uh, from where she's uh, running away. She said she's the only she's fool. Running in. She's the only <laughs> fool that she's coming from Paris. She wants to go in. And they said, and she paid for that to you? They said, yes, a lot. <laughs> and anyhow, and one of my things was to go to the museum, in fact. And it was under the war. It was in the beginning that the families, as a, the families was behind Khomeini. The, the country was attacked. Now it's totally normal. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was puzzled to see these kids looking at the, the Farah's uh, beautiful dressing. <gasps> That's much better than the sister of Zainab. The sister of Zainab, mm -hmm. they are the militia that they are running after yeah. the girl saying, don't put a uh, um, polished nail or this kind of yeah. things. And said, oh, I wish that the sister of Zainab, yeah. they could be like this. At that time, that it, it's, you know, it's normal, especially young people. You cannot take them back and, and absolutely, but you and. And I, I told them, you dare saying that to, to, I heard what you said. I said, no, 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 I, we don't dare, but that's true. Yeah, we can, yeah, yeah really exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's open up to questions. I think there's a microphone that's gonna be passed around. Um, and who has the mic? 
Oh, you do. So I'll just let you give it to whomever you want to give it to. So my only request is that please, if we, we go uh, boy, girl, boy, girl, so that that's, that's a very it's a rule that I always have. And woman, man, please. Woman, man, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. sorry, yes, yes. Ladies, a little bit more woman ladies, than man. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. yes, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Salam, uh, my name is Saira Firdos. Uh, I uh, actually have two questions. First of all, congratulations for making it to hot Muslim men list. Yeah. Can I do, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's that. My my greatest achievement. Yeah. How do you feel about it? <laughs> I, I didn't catch what you said. It's the, the, I didn't it's hear anyhow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that I, was a compliment. I'll no? explain it later. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's bringing a lot of traffic to uh, on internet uh, after <laughs> that uh, Fox News interview, I guess. Uh, coming um, to a serious question. You know, when we, when we talk about Iran internationally, I mean, Fox has always been on a uh, nuclear program, um, you know, democracy versus dictatorship. Um, uh, political prisoners, and I, I have experience of working with Iranians on various projects. And what I feel, uh, and I come from Kashmir, and I can understand the sense of oppression. Um, and what I what I feel is there has always been this focus on politics than on people. And um, one thing I want to ask is about basically about Baha'i community. Their denial to education is one thing that disturbs that could disturb anyone, and it's one thing, I mean, that people don't talk about much. I mean, after if you talk about nuclear program, blah, 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 maybe you know, women and skiing in Iran and blah, 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 but nobody really puts folks on that issue, and I haven't really seen Iranian diaspora talking about it. They do talk about peace education. I had a friend who worked on a project for a year and a half in Montreal, and then, of course, she wasn't allowed to do that project in Iran and ended up working in Kenya. But even for her, when I talked to her about how do you deal with Baha'i community because they don't have access to education there, mm -hmm. she didn't have an answer. So what, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah. Well, it's not just that they don't have access to education. They don't have access to the Constitution. Um, I live in Los Angeles, which has a very large Baha'i community, so I do a lot of work. Uh, on behalf of Baha'is and in, and in favor of, of uh, greater freedom and human rights for the Baha'i in Iran. For those of you unfamiliar with what we're talking about, although Iran does provide constitutional rights to a large number of religious minorities, the Baha'i are not one of them. The Baha'i are considered to be uh, a schism of Shia Islam and therefore have no rights. And when I say no rights, I mean quite literally no rights, that you can kill a Baha'i person and not go to jail for it. Um, uh, so, so what I, what the, and, and this issue of the, the fact that they're denied uh, an education, um, uh, they, can't, uh, uh, they, they, they can't be witnesses to crimes, there's a whole host of things. They, uh, they don't have the same property rights um, as uh, non-Baha'i Iranians. Um, all of this, I think, to the larger point that I want to make, however, is it's not that no one is talking about it. People do talk mm. about it. But the problem is, is that because we are so single-mindedly focused on Iran's nuclear program and on a quite deeply exaggerated fear mm -hmm. of Iran's nuclear program, it sort of sucks all the air out of the room and makes it impossible to talk about other important things, some of which are actually far more <laughs> important. And indeed, it becomes even more difficult for outside actors, particularly the United States, to exert positive influence on Iran to force it to uh, uh, respect human rights and, and, and so on, because the nuclear program has created such a, a, a isolation that is, it's created this distance between the United States and Iran, um, and you know many many years of profound um, sanctions against Iran, that we don't have the tools necessary to pressure Iran into changing its behavior. It's a very simple rule of foreign policy: it, you can't punish a country if you don't have any relationship with that country. 
uh, and we have no relationship with Iran, we've completely isolated it, and so there is no means for us to punish these kinds of violations, so we don't talk about it. It's uh, a little bit, uh, yeah, you explained it uh, pretty well, but I, I wanted to say it's not just Baha'i. Uh, you explained it, but maybe I, I can just add one thing. Actually, uh, human rights, it's not, they don't give a damn to human rights. Uh, democracy country, they don't give a damn. Uh, I go back to the Iraq-Iran war. They helped Iraq in the beginning to attack Iran. Even Israel had sent uh, weapons. The United States. United States troops, but Israel, I mean, United, yes. no, no, Israel. It, it was a deal with Israel through United, I mean, United States helped them. No, then, I'm sorry, when you say they don't give a damn no, about no, no. Iran, you mean Oxen the United Western, States. Western, Western. Yes. No, you, European countries is, is yeah, quite right, the same the thing. Absolutely. Then th th that is something that when you talk about Baha'is, I can say the same thing about the, the, the woman rights. The Sharia is still there if the women uh, are struggling fantastically and the civil society in Iran uh, just make not run them behind them. There is one, two problems. There is one international and geopolitical problem which has to be deal, uh, of course, between nation but with the Iranian society. I talk every single time, there is my friends here, whenever I go to the TV in France, they ask me about nuclear weapons, I come back to the human rights problem. And sometimes, recently they asked me whether as an opponent, I think that Iran should be uh, in the table of Geneva too about Syria. I said, yes. I said, how you said yes? Because I said, there is two war. There is one war that has to be uh, run by us Iranian, either are outside Iran, either inside Iran. And I really want to um, honor my fellow compatriots inside Iran. Some of them, they are fabulous, as I do all the time. All my books that are dedicated to this young generation, and especially women jurists that they are fighting in Iran. The slightest things I can do outside Iran, it's to be a voice of this. There is one that is, that is one part, and in that part, I should say something, if you allow me. We have to criticize ourselves as well. There is an autocriticism that Iranian, they don't want to put it on their shoulder. Whenever they said, the hand of CIA, uh, let the stay in France, so, no, we have to struggle for our own country, whether we are in, and we are not solid. Uh, we are really, uh, uh, n solidarity, it's not our uh, uh, big, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, str yeah, strengths. It's not. There is something, and for, for the, of course, the geopolitically, whenever they, to they tell me about in Iran, how do you think with, with this repression, um, uh, nobody, uh, uh, nobody can change things, maybe because there is a lot of, American in the Iranian, they would love America to interfere in Iran and make a war. I said, no, I don't want any war for human rights, for what's going on inside Iran, but outside, because they're not coming to free us. We've seen mm -hmm. what's happened in, in Iraq. We, 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 we've seen what's happened in Libya. I don't want that. I rather prefer the Mullahs. And that, but that's two different things. And when, uh, 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 it is difficult to make understand our fellow compatriots that politics is something very, very, very complicated. And in politics, you should see between worse and and le choix du moindre mal, the choice of the, the less, uh, mm, the less really worse, if, yeah. I, if I can say. Mm -hmm. the, then, and, and the, then about the Baha'is, in fact, uh, we have a committee in Paris with some of my friends that we are doing a lot because, as he said, Baha'i has no rights at all, and they're Iranian, and if they still, some of them, they are in Iran, it's because of this, because they want to struggle to say we are Iranian like others, and we stay there, because Khomeini say, told all of Iranian, whether Baha'i, whether you're not happy, go away. That's too easy. It's why I think I have to go back, and I will go back, whatsoever will be the price. And, but I must say, that's also for Christians and Catholics, in Iran, that you know that if there is a Muslim who kills uh, uh, a non-Muslim or a woman, 
uh, it's not the same sentences, it's too complicated to go to details. Then you see, the problem of human rights, whether it's Baha'i, whether it's women, whether sometimes it's rather better being a Baha'i and some kind of woman in Iran. Uh, and I mean, you know, who here this, 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 in this past two years about the, the, the woman situation in Iran? Nobody. It's, as he said, just the uh, um, nuclear, nuclear issue. issue. And nuclear issue sometimes is just a weapon in the hands of foreigner, foreign uh, um, Western country mm -hmm. to, for, for, for their own ge ge geopolitical uh, movements in the, in the region. Mm -hmm. And then it's to us to separate the two things and, as he said, to tell them, listen, uh, don't, and, 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 and also, as, as I uh, told yesterday, the press, unfortunately, there is no more free press in, uh, in, in at least not in France. <laughs> Uh, so gentlemen, gentlemen with a question? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm probably about to ask a very naive question. Uh, on one hand, uh, I, I, I can sense that uh, there is a bit of uh, an aspiration to mix with the global texture amongst the Iranian population. On the other hand, uh, Fariba just mentioned that we do not re really need any outside inter intervention to solve the problems of the dictatorship and democracy in Iran. What is the reason, according to you, uh, that the, 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 any movement like an Arab Spring did not begin in Iran? No, don't say that. The Arab Spring started in Iran. It's also one thing that people forget. In 2009, millions of Iranians, they came pacifically in the street after the vote that had been, uh, the, you know, that, that we had been cheated. The vote was for Musavi, who wanted to change a lot of things in Iran, who wanted to try to open Iran. We, and then Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Guide, had uh, ordered that uh, Ahmadinejad should come back to power. And all the votes, they have been, um, they have been uh, fraud, f first of all. And, uh, so many other, um, uh, other deal behind the, 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 the curtain. Then, you don't maybe remember how millions of Iranian, all cities, big cities, they came in the street, they made strike, and they have been shut down. This young lady, Neda, that she became a sim symbol, or Sohrab, which my poetry book is dedicated to them, they have been just shut down for nothing in the street, and thousands of them, they have been uh, in, in jail. Some of them, they're still in jail. Some of them, they had disappeared. It has been one of the worst repression of the past two years, and uh, Karubi, who is the other uh, opponent now, inner opponent, let's say, in the circle, he just denounced the rape and the torture in the prison for a mullah, he's a mullah, and he was one of the closest collaborator of the big uh, Khomeini, I mean, the father of the revolution, if we could call it like this. Then this had gone to all the Arab countries through uh, tweets, and, and Egyptian young people, they, they just say that uh, we have been inspired by Iranian uh, movement. But after that, it has been, com they understood that they should never let people come again to the street. And uh, whenever after 2009 there was some uh, validity to try again some strike, it has been totally repressed. And uh, if Rouhani came to power, it's also for that. Because they understand now they have to open little by little. Mm -hmm. the, the next time it could be a burst out or in fact a war from, uh, from foreign countries to Iran, either Israel, either United States, either all of them, I don't know. But uh, the Arab Spring started in Iran, again, like our constitution, which started in Iran and went other way, <laughs> so to other countries. Yeah. It all starts in Iran. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it is no, true. It's, it's it true. Is, no, 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 it is true. I mean, it's, it's just a, a historical fact that yeah. the template uh, for how to actually create mass people movement mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. dictatorial states started in 
Iran. I mean, again, the, the notion of social media, the word Twitter Absolutely. revolution was, was coined uh, in 2009 because of Iran. And, and quite clearly, the, the Egyptian revolutionaries, the January 25th movement, the April 6th movement have repeatedly said that they learned the lesson of how to bring down uh, government from the Iranians. But it then begs the question, why didn't it work in Iran where mm -hmm. it, it worked elsewhere? And that's a very, very good question because the answer is instructive of the failure of the West, and particularly in the United States, in its foreign policy towards Iran. Here's the problem. Fatiba is absolutely right. Millions of Iranians poured out onto the streets, but the poor never followed. The difference between what happened in Tahrir Square and mm. what happened in Iran is that although both of those revolutions were started and the backbone of which was the middle class, the youth, the young people, the people in the middle class, those were the ones who started the re revolutions in Tunisia, in, in Egypt, and in Iran. But here is the difference, is that in places like Tunisia, in places like Egypt, those young middle class kids were able to convince the poor to join them. And once that happened, that's all she wrote. In Iran, that never happened. And it never happened for a very important reason. You have to understand, about 40% of the Iranian population lives below the poverty line. The, this 40% relies on the government for their most basic mm, needs. I mean, literally milk and bread is delivered on a daily basis from the government. Literally cash handouts mm. given to the poor. Why? Because unlike Egypt and Tunisia, which is integrated in the global market, Iran has for more than three decades been sanctioned and isolated and completely removed from the international market, from the free market. And so as a result, it has had to rely, the sort of self-reliance self, uh, that uh, has created an enormous governmental control over the economy, over the private enterprise, over private markets, et cetera. Now and understand administration, this for a moment. Administration, and administration, the very thing. Now, understand, see, see how this works for a moment. Yeah, you see, a tyrant stays in power by isolating his people. Mm. We have done the tyrant's work for him for 30 years in Iran. The, the, by the way, that 40% under the poverty line, if you ask them, they would say, oh yeah, we hate this government. We'd love for it to go away. But if it means that there will be a disruption in my daily intake of calories for my children, then no, 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 I'll take this to, to you know, revolution. And, for that reason, we saw the sort of the self-destructive nature of America's foreign policy towards Iran. And it goes back to what I was saying before. If you don't have a relationship with a country, you can't punish it. In the end, there was a phone call made from the White House to the Egyptian government that said, you still want that $1.5 billion? It's time for you to go into retirement. Sure, okay. independence it's as simple as that. We have money in Iran. That, there is another that, country, that call can yeah. never happen yeah. in Iran. But there is another, there is another thing also that uh, you didn't mention, maybe you don't agree. The revolution, the Arab revolution, the organization was behind are the, were the Islamists in a way. They were somewhere. That's, uh, no, 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 they were. No, no, no. The young people, they were there. But when you said the poor, they follow because that I know about it, believe me, I've, I've done study about that. They, because they said the power will be us, the uh, brother, uh, the, the, the brother. The Muslim Brotherhood did the not Muslim join brother, the revolution until they, they, much, they, they much did later. That, that, much, but, much later. Of course, but in the beginning, they didn't prevent the poor to go there. They thought the, it will come to us, and, and, and they were right. They were right because they were the one that they were totally organized. In Tunisia, Poor people, they went because they couldn't, you know, the, the, the difference between poor and, uh, and, and also what you say is true. Iran has money. The others, they are, uh, they, 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 their money comes from tourism. They, they, uh, but organization, who organized what and where? Even if in Egypt it was a dictatorship, 
they have young people, they have still could get a kind of um, uh, small um, association. In Iran, you, there is no, no right for any single, uh, even little kind of association unless it is the Islamic Association. And when the Islamic Association became an opponent, like the, the, um, the, the, the guy that is in, in, in jail, then they, 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 just, uh, they, they just crashed them and, or, or they put them in jail. They, well, they, I'm not they, sure they, if that's true. I mean, Iran has, has unions, it has student associations, it has, uh, I, I a, think lot, it, yeah. it has a lot of NGOs, yeah. oh, yes. and those, those, yes. those organizations were deeply the, yeah, a part of it. But not for political, I mean, if they come to the street to say, we don't want you, and they said well, it, sure, the, yeah, that's it. Of course, yeah, that's, it, yeah, it. that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, I that's think organization true. was also important in, in, in the, uh, um, the, the Arab Spring. But what you say, it's absolutely true that the, the Egypt economy, <laughs> it's linked with the United States. It's, it's what US, happened yeah. in 79 in Iran. The Shah was totally under the control of the United States. It's why, by the way, the Mullah could get so easily, so easily, if, you know, finish the whole democratic revolution of the, the, the majority of the people and put it in, in the Islamic revolution. Yeah. But anyhow, that goes to, to history and uh, we have Time to for a lady. write it best. Just a quick question. Uh, I was puzzled, Riza, by something you said twice, which was that uh, what kind of relationship are you advocating between America and Iran? that they can make a phone call and tell something to stop happening in Iran? No. And no. is that the kind of unequal power relationship you would wish for Iran? I think what we need between the United States and Iran is to have a relationship based on interdependent trade. The problem, again, is that because Iran's economy is not integrated to the global economy, it does not have to be responsible to anybody else. Uh, the problem is that, for instance, I'll give you a very simple example of this. For 10 years, we have been keeping Iran from joining the World Trade Organization. Why? Mm. That is the dumbest thing ever. If Iran was part of the World Trade Organization, it falls under international no, laws absolutely. about how it, it has to maintain its finances. So, for instance, when it wants to privatize an industry, what it does nowadays is it just hands it over to some revolutionary guard guy uh, or some, you know, some mullah, and now he owns the telecommunications industry, and now this, this guy owns the rubber industry. If you're a member of the World Trade Organization, you are forbidden from doing that. You have to maintain a, an There is open, some kind of control at least. Process, yeah, right. Absolutely. So, if you do something wrong, okay, if, if you start slaughtering people on the streets, you can get punished for that by having your, your membership revoked, which would then collapse the economy that is dependent on interdependent trade. If you don't have a relationship, if Iran has nothing to lose because it has no relationships with the outside world, then it could do whatever yeah, it wants to Yeah, and they to don't give a damn to their own people. They have a lot of money. They distribute this money among themselves. The, the army has 80%, 85% of the economy of the country, and they don't give any notice to anyone. Then they do whatsoever they want. They, that is, that is absolutely, not just for the United States. Norm, it has to open way. with the I know foreign country. I know what you're going to say, that you yeah. think that what I'm advocating is some sort of economic co colonization, the way that the United States has uh, with uh, you know, other countries in the Middle East. And of course, that's not what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, absolutely. That said, Iran sits on the second largest supply of oil and natural gas in the region. And obviously, part of opening up the country to the rest of the world would be flooding the international market with Iranian gas. It would become a petro uh, dictatorship. But here's an undeniable fact that has been proven again and again over, throughout the 20th century which is that without economic development, there cannot be political development. The problem with Iran otherwise, right now, otherwise, the problem have, with Iran yeah. right now is precisely the fact that the, the, there is no middle class left in Iran. The middle class, insofar as the leisure class, simply does not exist in any robust way any longer. And so 
because of that, it becomes very difficult to advocate for the kind of profound political reform that so many of us want to see without the kind of economic development that goes hand in hand with it. So what am I advocating for? I'm advocating for the China model. That's what I'm advocating for. We don't love China. We don't love China at all. In fact, we, China is very much America's biggest uh, uh, opponent in, in the world. But we are absolutely dependent on, uh, on this sort of inter, interdependent trade with China, which keeps our countries from actually engaging in any kind of open conflict. And that interdependent trade has created an enormous economic boost in China, creating a brand new middle class. Now, is China a democracy? Absolutely not. But you're a fool if you think that today's China looks anything like the China of 10 years ago or the China of 20 years ago. Do you honestly believe that if 300,000 Chinese poured onto the streets of Tiananmen Square tomorrow, the Chinese government would turn off the lights and kill them all again, like they did in 1989? No way. That cannot happen anymore. Why? Because it's bad for business. That's why. And that is a good thing. Now, and, and just, there's a uh, long way to just, go. There's a uh, long way to go, but. No, no, no. It's not just because it's good for business. I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, Chinese labels they don't accept anymore. They, you know, there is more and more sun, uh, union in China. There is more and more people that they want to, uh, they, they, they yes. say slavery, finish Look, in at China. The, at the municipal Mid level, yeah, there's exactly. an enormous amount that, of democratic That is the control. only way for Iranian to be able inside Iran, <clears throat> little by little, to say you cannot do whatsoever you want. First, you cannot do whatever you want with our money, because this money, this, this wealth in Iran belongs to anyone. And second, as soon as it's little bit open, as a, um, uh, an activist for human rights and women rights and a writer, I will have much more oh, yeah. back than now. Oh, yeah. That they don't give a damn. Even as a French, when, I, when they told to the, you know, when I went to see, I wanted to go back to Iran with my Iranian passport. And <clears throat> French authorities told me, you know, Mrs. Hashtrudi, we will do whatsoever because you are a French citizen. Not because they love me, because there is institution in France, and I know that the movement of, of uh, journalists would have been uh, important. But they said, but on, you go as an Iranian under the Iranian law and Sharia law. You know that. I said, yes, I know that. And that it's, of course, still for all Iranian when we, you, we go there, whether you, they don't accept double nationality, they don't accept, and as he said, even for this, they will be obliged to accept more and more international laws and uh, the, the international way of living together. But I think if not, I am not uh, fond of China, I've been five, five times in China, but if not, we might have 10 times worse than what we have right now. Because Western country and United States or uh, Mr. Hollande and uh, Israel just close to Iran, they will never let Iran to go on like this, neither. But not for the people, they don't give a damn, for us, for their own interest. Then it is in our interest as a civil society to push the opening of Iran. Through trade, he is right. I, I, I am still, I have some kind of, uh, you know, because of my mes soixante feet, my youth, my, uh, still some kind of, um, let's say, utopia on um, Marxist um, utopia mm -hmm. that it has been. <laughs> but I think we are wrong. The, the, unfortunately, we have been wrong, and, uh, and no way, especially right now that there is no more, uh, to, you know, to, to poll in the world, then. And, the, and the one very, and we're out of time, but one very important difference between China and Iran is that while, as we were saying, at the municipal level, China is experimenting with democracy in, in profound ways. And yes, it has not reached the government yet. It is still a unipolar, it is still a, a, an oligarchical 
uh, government, but as I say, it has no resemblance to the China of a decade ago. The difference, however, of course, is that Iran does have a deep and abiding tradition of dem democratic movements. Now, it's a democratic movement that has been absolutely crushed by a shadow government, but if you open the door just a little bit in yes, Iran to the absolutely. outside world, these kids will break the door down. The problem right now is that because they have so little access to the rest of the world, that they cannot actually uh, um, express the power that they themselves have over this, this government because the government controls every lever of life, especially the economy. And so that's it, and it's not, it's not complicated. Reform only comes from within, not from the outside. That doesn't mean that the outside doesn't have a role to play, but the role is not what you think it is. Yeah. The role is to simply provide the Iranian people themselves with the means necessary to actually reform their country. And the means necessary, whether we'd like to admit it or not, is money. It's about, uh, it's about- Interest. It, yeah, yeah, simply, simply having the opportunity yeah, exactly. to integrate to the rest of the world, to integrate to the, to the uh, free market economy. That, that in, in and of itself would transform Iran uh, in, in a very short amount of time. Whereas three and a half decades of isolation, sanctions, uh, has done nothing at all. And, and yet, violence, and, and very, we just very keep doing it. We just keep terrible doing it. violence. My last book, novel, it's about what's going on in the, in, in, in the prison of Iran, which is a very short book, but uh, you know, I've been uh, so much involved in human rights. I, I heard so many testimony of what has been gone to this young uh, men and women then some of the parts read by some um, journalists, they asked, uh, you know, they just interviewed me before coming here. They told me, you have been in jail by yourself because mm. you describe all that so well. I said, thank you, but we have been in a way in jail, all of us. If you, if you are considering this young uh, activist in Iran or not even activist, some of them they are taking as a, as a I don't know how to say, to, 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 to you know, they take your wife, let's say, mm -hmm. to just make you talk. And then if you go deep in their situation and in their mind, and as I heard history for months, years, then believe me, sometimes I could feel what they, at, at least in, not in my body, that, that would have been a, a lie because you, no, no can talk about torture when or she or he hadn't been tortured. But I've been, as I said to a journalist, I've been tortured in my soul. Really, I've been tortured in my soul. Uh, and, and that's, you have no idea. Once Iran will be open, and the door of the jail will be open, a part of it has been said by this mullah that he, by himself, he went to jail, not really to jail, but in a, in a, in a, in a house, uh, house, house arrest, house, exactly. But that's a part of it. That's a part of it then uh, neither, I don't want any more that, as he said, three and a half decades of that, and I don't want Iran to be like Iraq or Syria, or then, in fact, I rather prefer American economy goes to Iran, mm -hmm. that Iran goes to, the, to, to, the, to his knees and, and be a, a, a country like, we are surrounded by, by turmoil and, and by, by war. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.